Well, good morning. How y'all doing today? Good to see you. How many of y'all have been through a DHT before? Okay, is that in person or just by tape? In person? How many, how many in person? You many in person? Okay. All right, well, good. Well, I had somebody told me today they felt like they knew me, and I said, you knew me and you showed up anyway. That's a good sign. So that's, <clears throat> well, we're going to get started here. We uh, got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to do it in three days. Can everybody hear me okay? Do I have to? I, no? Yes? No? Not quite? Talk louder? Well, I'm on there, but not on here. We may have to run. If we can get to this first session, we'll run it through the house sound and go that way. So uh, if we're going to start, though, let's get started. Let's pray. Father, here we are, ready to learn your will, do your will, accomplish your will on this earth. And Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come together in the name of your Son, that we can gather up and learn the Word of God, and that we have the ability to do your will. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we just say, take your pleasure here. Have pleasure in what we do. Lord, we give these meetings to you. And we just say that we want to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> just to get started, uh, I'll give you some housekeeping stuff real quick. We'll be working through the manual. Uh, I'm not going to read the manual to you word for word. Okay, uh, the manual. <clears throat> there, I'm going to. I will be teaching you a lot more than what's in the manual. The um, the manual is to be used after I'm gone. As you read it, it will cue things that I have said. So I would encourage you also to make notes. Uh, like I said, we're going to. Basically, I've been studying healing for the last 30 years, and we have. We're going to condense it to three days. Okay, so we're going to cover a lot of information. Uh, we Actually, I don't have cards with me, but we will get some. But what we generally ask is that if you have questions, that instead of just coming up and asking me a question during the break or something, which means only you get to hear the answer, we try to get people to write the questions down on an index card, which we will get some cards for you. If you write the questions down, then bring them up during a break and just put them up here on the pulpit somewhere, and we will answer them during the course of the training. I'll read them. <clears throat> I may read them out loud to you, or if I see that we're going to answer it during the course of the training, I may just wait and answer it during the training. Um, somebody's car is going off. <laughs> so, oh, that reminds me. If you have cell phones, let's turn them off or put them on vibrate or some way that only you will know that they're operating. Um, a lot of times we do broadcast over the internet. We're not during these meetings. I didn't bring the equipment or a camera operator that knows how to do that. So we'll be doing these. Uh, we'll be putting these tapes onto CD and DVD uh, as soon as we get back to Texas, which will be. It'll take us about a week. Well, I'll be back in about a week, and then it'll take me about a week or so to get them done. So if you are interested in these meetings and you want them on CD or DVD, all you have to do is write our office. Tell them which meetings. They were the ones here, obviously. And uh, we will. my daughter will work with you uh, to get those meetings. My daughter is the one that usually answers the phone. Uh, that's Crystal. And she will be glad to help you get whatever material you need. So, uh, secondly, <clears throat> what else? We will be... Now, don't hold me to this literally, okay? <laughs> but we try to operate in 45-minute sessions. It just kind of depends. Now, I, I try not to go over an hour, but um, it just depends on where we're at, at when the 45-minute mark hits. Uh, if we're in the middle of something, I'm not going to stop and then take a break and come back. We'll go ahead and finish it. But uh, we generally run in 45-minute sessions. We'll take about a 15-minute break and then come back for another 45. And then we'll do roughly six sessions per day. We will break it around 12 noon and break until 2 o'clock for lunch which if you can't eat in two hours, there's a problem, okay? So, <clears throat> so, um, but, uh, and then we'll go to about 5 o'clock each day, and then Saturday night we have a healing service at 7 p.m. And so we want to um, make sure that you know the schedule. Uh, generally we start, most people, it's advertised starting at 9. Uh, I never plan to start at 9 because that would throw my time off, and people are still coming in until about 9.15, so... If we start about a quarter after, usually everybody's in and seated and ready to go, and it operates. So we're not running late. We're right on time, all right? Uh, <clears throat> well, 
I'll just say it this way. If you have children, you know sometimes that you say we have to leave at this time and you know really you have to leave by this time because you have to get them ready. So uh, that's kind of the way we do these meetings. Uh, there's usually a, a great move of God about five minutes before the meeting actually starts and that's when everybody rushes in. And so we try to, uh, to work with people on that. We don't want people to miss the material. Now over the next three days, <clears throat> as I said, we're going to cover a lot of material. I can almost guarantee that unless you've heard this before, pretty much everything you will hear will be new, right? And it'll be different. But it will also be scripture. The main thing that uh, you're going to find out about me is that I am very literal. I read the Bible exactly what it says. I don't read anything in or anything out. Matter of fact, that has caused some problems at times in various places that I've been. Um, I don't, I go into all kinds of churches. I've spoke in, uh, say I've spoken Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Charismatic, Word of Faith, pretty much the whole range. Um, I haven't been invited to a Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall yet, but I'm waiting for that invitation. <coughs> and, and when I get it, I will go. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so I really, I have not geared this toward any group's belief system. Um, this is <coughs> just Bible. And so I'm not real interested. I love church history. I love charismatic church history, Pentecostal church history. Um, I love history in general, as a matter of fact, but that doesn't mean that I like church traditions or, um, as we would call them, sacred cows. Uh, generally, a lot of church traditions and their beliefs tend to keep people bound while adhering to their tradition, as opposed to going with the Word of God and setting people free. And so, I really, I'm, I'm not real interested in people's opinion or church doctrine in that sense. I'm interested in Bible doctrine. I'm interested in what Jesus taught, uh, what Paul taught, what the apostles taught. And so we will work from that viewpoint as opposed to a church viewpoint. Um, I've belonged to many different churches over the years and <clears throat> there's only a couple of things that they all ha had in common. And even in that, sometimes what they said they believed, they didn't believe. And so one of the main keys that you're going to find out over the next three days is that <clears throat> Jesus only gave two reasons for failure. He said one was your unbelief. He said the other reason for failure was by your traditions you make the word of God of none effect. And so pretty much what we do for the next three days is essentially take up the traditions that men have built up over the last 2,000 years dealing with the word of God and healing and power of God and we just systematically destroy them. And once they're gone, then you don't have any hindrance to believing the Word of God. And once you believe the Word of God, it works. Uh, don't need a whole lot extra after that. So uh, basically, <clears throat> and, and we'll, we'll talk about several things along the way. You'll get some understanding of how we came into this teaching and how we came to believe what we do and see the results that we see. Uh, the good thing is, is that... Um, God uses people's background a lot of times to get a message out through them. Uh, <clears throat> you'll find out if you don't already know, my background predominantly has, was in two phases. Um, I was raised in church to some degree, but um, my, my, actually when I was very young I was hit by a car. And I'll, I'll talk more about that a little bit later on because that's actually part of the overall testimony of why we're doing what we're doing. But... During that time, my mom taught me to read by using the King James Bible. And so I didn't go to school right away, but uh, we read through the Bible about, I think we, she said one time it was five or six times before I started school. And um, <clears throat> finally, whenever, just before I started school, instead of her reading me to sleep with the Bible, I w she would make me read the Bible to her. And eventually she would fall asleep. Before I did, I, I tell people I'm still doing that today, is reading people to sleep with the Bible. It's still, it's still going on. So... Um, <clears throat> But the one thing that, um, well, the two phases, as I said, one was uh, from about nine years of age up until about 30, I don't know, 35, something like that, uh, I, I was involved in and taught martial arts. And then the second phase, of course, was when I was in the military. And so those two aspects of my life had a great 
impact on the way that I see things and the way that I look at things. And so, you know, I, <clears throat> I remember whatever I was just uh, starting to read the Bible again, if, you know, from a ministerial viewpoint, that um, I started finding all these books on the shelves at bookstores. Um, what was his name? Keller? I think it was. Someone, they wrote the book, um, uh, What a Gardener Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and they had all these different things, you know, like a gardener and a farmer and a fisherman look, and all these things. And I thought, you know, someday somebody's going to write a book like that would be, uh, you know, a, a soldier looks at the Gospels. And so I started thinking about that and looking at it, and it was amazing. About that same time, I came across a book that even today, as a matter of fact, it's with me in my motel room now because I still carry it, and it's called God at War uh, by a man named Gregory Boyd. If you ever get a chance, you should read it. It's about that thick. It's, um, it's a good, it is, it is extremely well written. It is um, well documented, annotated, all that. I mean, it is a very good book. Uh, but he details how every aspect of Jesus' life was an act of warfare. And when I started reading that, I thought, okay, this is pretty far out there. So I started going through the scriptures and looking at it and just reading the Bible. <clears throat> and it really is amazing that how the church has overlooked the warfare aspect of healing, deliverance, and just setting the captives free. I mean, even the very language that Jesus used would have easily fit into a military mindset. Now, I will try to keep a lot of the military... Um, <clears throat> Um, how can I say it, the terminology down. Uh, it's going to be hard to do here in Virginia. I can tell you. So, you know, I was thinking on the way up here because I drove up. I enjoy driving and uh, it gives me time to just think and especially when I travel by myself, it gives me time to just spend with God in a car and uh, I listen to worship music. I listen to some teaching CDs, different things like that. But it mainly just gives me time to spend with God. And on the way up, I was able to go through, well, I purposed to go through uh, up Highway 81 to go through VMI and stop and visit and talk to them there. And uh, one of the things I was thinking of, because of the history, you know, almost every meeting that I hold, I will ask, you know, who is here from the United States and who is here from another country? And invariably, there will be people from other countries. You know, that we, I think the last meeting we had uh, down in Birmingham, we had about four I think people from three or four different countries show up, fly into Birmingham, Alabama, just to go to a DHT, which says something in itself about how determined they were to get there. But um, it's funny, too, because a lot of places I go, I'll say, who is here from other countries? And as we start naming them off, there will always be somebody there from Texas that will raise their hand. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just a Texan mindset, Okay. We started as a republic. We still have that mindset. Uh, you know, we never really got over the fact that they let Alaska in and it became the, the largest state. It's still a, a sore spot with us. So, And, and honestly, if, if uh, Governor Perry has his way, I may have to use a passport to get back up here next time. Um, I don't know if you've heard about him talking about secession, Texas seceding again. So, you know, from coming from Texas and, and thinking about that, I've looked at moving to Colorado before. We've looked at moving actually into Oregon. And I always thought, well, if I move, you know, one of the biggest drawbacks about moving there was the fact that I'm a Texan. And I kept thinking, I don't want to give up my Texas driver's license. I, I, I don't want Colorado tags on my truck, on my Tahoe. I want Texas tags. It's just, you know, I, you know, every, you know, in the old days, every Hebrew person had to go up to Jerusalem at least once a year. Uh, well, with us, it's the Alamo. Okay, in Texas, you got to go to the Alamo at least once a year. It's just the way it is. So... Um, in that, every time I would go somewhere, I would think, well, I could move here. I could, I could live there. It'd be okay. And I thought, but, but in my mindset, it was always, I would be a Texan living in Colorado. That was just my mindset. And, I, and on the way up here, I thought, you know, Virginia, I think, is the only state where, after I was there a little while, I'd actually say I was a Virginian. You know, because I don't know of any other state that has a greater history of independence, of standing up for rights, and just of honor and the courage and the commitment and the dedication and sacrifice, I don't know of any other state that has that kind of history. And so I, I really, being a historian to some degree, um, I really appreciate being here. This is, like I said, our third time here. Uh, I was in Richmond once before. 
I was in Chesapeake, I think a couple of years ago, and then I was in Kilmarnock, uh, actually several, many years ago now. But um, matter of fact, I've got some good testimonies from all three places, but especially Kilmarnock, God taught me something uh, very, very important when I was in Kilmarnock. And I'll be sharing that with you because I share it in every DHD. So um, during this time, <clears throat> you will, uh, well, I'll just put it this way. If I do my job right, by the time we finish, you won't think of healing as a doctrine. You won't think of it even as of a, a part of church in the way we normally think of church. Uh, technically speaking, Jesus, when he mentioned church, he wasn't talking about what we see today. Um, which, you know, I'm not against how we do things necessarily. I'm just saying that I don't think he envisioned the way things are today in the church. And so I think that um, when we get down to it and really start studying what Jesus said, you will find that more than talking about the church, he talked about the kingdom. And if I do my job well and do it right, then by the time we finish, you will see healing as an aspect of kingdom warfare opposed to another kingdom warfare. <clears throat> and that every sickness and disease is an attack by the kingdom of darkness against humanity. And that the purpose, or a purpose, in the kingdom of God is to eradicate sickness and disease, along with sin, on the earth. And so, we have to develop toward that. Now, <clears throat> this is the first DHT, obviously, based on the time schedule, that um, I will have conducted uh, since this recent outbreak of the swine flu. Uh, so it is very timely. Uh, I can tell you right now, we have seen every part of the human body healed. We have seen every sickness and disease that we have ever encountered beaten. Doesn't mean we've won 100% of the cases, but I'm saying there is not one disease that we have not seen defeated. Um, <clears throat> I personally have prayed for over 70,000 people. Uh, most, uh, probably, I, I believe the last estimate was uh, 75 or 78 percent of those are, are classified as terminal. Uh, out of that 70,000, we've lost 30. Not 30,000, 30 people. And that's been over the last 10 years. Um, which, you know, the, when you look at statistics on paper, that's great. When you think about the 30, then it affects differently because it wasn't good enough. And the more I know about healing, and the more we see the power of God, the, the more, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't get easier, put it that way. It gets harder when you lose someone. Because the more you know, and the more you see what the Bible says, the more you realize that it did not have to be that way. And so it doesn't hurt less, it hurts more. Because you know somewhere along the way, you messed up. Essentially, that's what it comes down to. Now, um, you're going to hear a lot of nuggets. Matter of fact, I had a young man traveling with me a couple of years ago that uh, I asked him to make a note on every nugget that we put out there, every little point. And he basically just sat in the congregation and made notes. And when we finished, he had uh, 1,546 points that we make in three days. Okay? Now, we only do, you know, six sessions. So I think that averaged about 90 points per session in a 45-minute session. So that's two points per minute on the average that we'll be making. So obviously they're not all in the book because we don't have a 1,500-page book. Uh, secondly, it is obvious that you're not going to catch all of it the first time around. So I'm not saying this to try to get you to buy CDs or anything, but I am telling you if you're serious and you want things to change, then you do need to listen to it, study it, go over it, and just like you do anything else, repetition is the mother of memory, right? Um, that's the way that you remember it. It is the way that you understand it. And a lot of this, like I said, is so different. And the problem is this, and again, going back to kind of some military terminology, the way you train is the way you will fight. And if you don't drill, then you're not trained, right? See, this is teaching. This is not training. Now, we will get to the training part, and there is a training aspect. But 
<clears throat> training means doing what you've been taught. Okay? Training is to practice it. And you must practice and drill because when you get into the, into the battle, in the heat of the battle, as we would say, <clears throat> you can't think. You have to react. And you, have to re you will react according to where the majority of your mind is. Now, over the next three days, uh, we will, you will hear me quote Romans 12, 1 through 3 quite a bit because that is the essence of everything we do. Now, <clears throat> Romans 12, 1 through 3, basically, the essence of it is this. That we are not to be conformed to this world. Meaning that the world, we should not let the world mold us from the outside pressure of the world to where we look like it. But it says, but, rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the problem is, most people think that you're going to be transformed by attending church. And it doesn't say that. Now again, that's a good thing. You know, I'm not saying don't attend church, alright? But just going to church doesn't renew your mind and it doesn't transform your life. Right? You can look around. Matter of fact, many people in church today, their lives aren't transformed and they're basically there hoping for a transformation or waiting for something to happen. Now, the renewing of the mind is the key to, to victory. Because when you get born again, and I'm, I'm giving you kind of an overview at this point, we're going to come back and hit all these a little bit later, piece by piece. But essentially what happens is when you get born again, your spirit is recreated. There is life put into your spirit by the life of God. Your mind has been changed a little bit. Right? Your mind is not renewed, but your spirit is recreated and completely brand new. Right? Now, the only thing you have to do, or had to do, with being recreated, being born again, is submitting your will to the will of God and accepting Jesus and accepting forgiveness of sins and accepting the life of God to come into you and making Jesus your Lord. Right? Now, at that point, basically what you did was you used your free will to agree with God and give Him permission to recreate you. You didn't recreate you, right? God did it. And what he does, he does perfect. So your spirit is perfect and complete. The Bible says that you are perfect and complete in him. That is talking about your spirit. So there is nothing that needs to be added or done to your spirit now after being born again. However, the Bible says for us to renew our mind. God recreates our spirit, we renew our mind. The problem is, <clears throat> the human spirit has no way of communicating with the outside world except it first goes through the soul, which expresses itself in the body, either through the lips, hands, something along those lines. So generally, a person who is uh, in a coma or paralyzed or you know, has no way of... of um, speaking or seeing or hearing, uh, they have no way to communicate. Their spirit cannot communicate with the outside world. It is as if it is trapped inside a body that won't work. Now, <clears throat> the situation is that for us to allow the Spirit of God to flow from our spirits to affect the world, for that to happen our minds have to be renewed, which means to be lined up with our spirit. Now, your spirit is perfect. Your spirit understands the Bible. It is Christ who is birthed in you. Jesus being the Word of God, He is the Word made flesh. It, we are born again of incorruptible seed, and we're going to go all over this these next few days. But essentially what I'm saying is this. God did a good job when He got you born again. All right, What He did was good. It was complete, and you can't add anything to that. That's why, no matter how messed up your mind is, once you get born again, if you died, you go to be with the Lord. Right? Doesn't matter if your body's sick, still go be with the Lord. Right? Sick body doesn't keep you out of heaven. Right? Unrenewed mind, technically, doesn't keep you out of heaven. Now, the Bible says that the carnal mind, which is an unrenewed mind, is death. It doesn't mean, you're, you know, if you have a born-again spirit, but an unrenewed mind, doesn't mean you're going to hell. Right? All it means is, you will... 
meet God face to face much quicker. Right? If your mind is not renewed. It's the way it works. Now, our job, and what we're going to be doing over the next three days, is renewing your mind uh, specifically in the areas of healing and the power of God. And so that's what we're going to be working on. Now, I, I'm not here to give uh, lectures on, you know, church polity or, 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 you know, church, well, in some areas, church doctrine, but uh, I'm not here to tell you how to have church, all right? Um, so if you write down questions, don't ask me about, you know, where the piano should be or what color carpet you should have, all right? Because first off, you probably won't like my answer because um, to me it doesn't matter if you have either, right? What matters is, are you touching the world, right? Not so much what goes on in here, but what you do with what you learn here out there. Because if you're not going to do anything with it out there, well, actually we have, uh, I didn't bring any t-shirts with us, but we have some t-shirts we did that have the JGLM logo on it, and on the back it says, if your gospel isn't touching others, it hasn't touched you. And so basically everything we do, the only reason I'm sharing this with you is because I expect you to share it with other people. All right? Uh, what goes in your ear should come out your mouth. And so you should never keep anything to yourself. You should pass it along. Now, we have um, groups all over the, actually all over the world now. Uh, I think I've been to almost 30 countries so far. And we have groups in each of those countries. And now we have, uh, due to necessity, we've actually, we do license, we ordain, we also now plant churches, we have missionaries, and uh, <clears throat> we're, we're growing even here in the United States. We've got what we call life teams, which are specifically groups meeting together to learn to change their community, right? It's not just a group to get together to study. That's, that's the problem with most of the cell-oriented stuff, is that it's based on teach me something, grow me up, that kind of stuff. And what people don't realize is that you do not grow by learning. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. We have a lot of people in church that are learning, even the cell groups, always learning. But love requires action. And the problem in the cell groups is we're always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth, which basically means you have to do what you learn. And so the life teams are specifically geared toward reaching your community at whatever level of Christian knowledge you have. Because until you start reaching your community, you will not grow. All right? Spiritual knowledge, or, or I should say, knowledge of Scripture, does not relate to spiritual growth. All right? A whole bunch of people can quote Scripture. Yeah. Jehovah Witnesses can quote Scripture probably better than most people in this room. But it doesn't mean they're spiritual. It doesn't mean that they have an understanding of the truth. It just means they have a lot of knowledge, right? So it's not about knowledge. As a matter of fact, you're going to find out that I'm not really so much going to teach you new things <clears throat> as much as we're going to whittle away the things that you've learned that have been wrong to get you to a point where all that's left is truth, okay? <clears throat> There's two types of, of sculptor. There's a one type that takes clay and packs it on and tries to form something and then when it wants to make it, you know, finish it, it takes more clay and adds to. <clears throat> then there's another type of sculptor that takes a large block of some type of marble or something like that and starts chipping away until what they see in that is revealed. Right? God is the second type. Okay? He doesn't keep adding to. He chips away. Now... Once you understand that, then you're going to find out that what our, our goal is not to keep adding new knowledge, new doctrines, new things. Our goal is to strip away everything that is useless, everything that is inaccurate, till we come to just a, well, what Paul calls the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. Uh, that's, that's been one of the problems in the church, is that we have moved away from the simplicity of the gospel and have moved into a theological gospel which, just, uh, well, the way that I usually say it is this. When Jesus came in his flesh on the earth the first time, he <clears throat> demonstrated Christianity as a relationship with God. Then, for, after he left, then it was passed on to, basically, to Greece 
and it became a philosophy. Then it went to Rome, became a religion. And then it came to America and became an enterprise. And so we have to um, get it back to the original purpose of a relationship with God. Now, many of you may have come because you've heard of John G. Lake or, or you know something about his history. Is that, do y'all know John G. Lake? Y'all know what, what he did? Okay. Um, <clears throat> people have asked me, why do we call this John G. Lake Ministries? I will get into that probably in the next session or so and show you who he was, what he did. But just to give you a real quick overview was that uh, as a young man, he had 16 brothers and sisters. Before he turned 21, eight of them were dead because of sickness or disease. So he obviously had, uh, was acquainted with sickness. Uh, when he was married at 21, uh, right after he was married, right after his marriage, his wife began dying of a congenital heart disease. At that time, there was a man a couple of hundred miles away uh, that had a tremendous healing ministry and really reintroduced healing back into the church. And his name was John Alexander Dowie. <clears throat> and Dowie was quite a character, uh, which if you study his life, it just goes to show that a lot of times miracles and healings don't necessarily follow accurate doctrine. Okay? Uh, God follows faith. And a man can have wrong doctrine, but yet believe God, and God will still work through him. Uh, thank God. And so... Uh, he heard about, John Lake heard about Dowie and said, we've got to go there and get some help. Well, Lake's brother and sister were dying. His sister was dying of a cancer and his brother had some other issues, some stomach issues and different things. And they both went to Dowie and both came back healed. So when Lake's wife began to die, they immediately contacted Dowie and uh, they couldn't get her there because it was too far away and she couldn't travel. So Lake sent, sent a telegram and said, please pray, my wife is dying. Dowie wrote back, said, I'm praying. He said, hold on to God, I'm praying she will live. That was it. Uh, well, actually, he also said, I'll, I'll, I will pray at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Well, at 9.30 in the morning, they were all gathered around Jenny's bed. Uh, when the clock struck 9.30, she said, Dowie is praying, so I must be healed. And so she got out of bed and was healed. Now, you know, whose faith, you know, who knows, all right? Um, regardless, she was healed. So immediately Lake said, I'm going to Chicago and I'm going to study divine healing so that I can teach it and practice it. Now, so many people think that Lake was just, had a healing anointing or a gift of healing. And I'm not saying he didn't have a gift or anything, but just thinking that God picked him out and said, I'm going to anoint this one. It wasn't that. Lake said, I'm going after healing. So the Bible says to, to <clears throat> covet spiritual gifts. It talks about going after the things of God. And one of the things you're going to find out is that very few people that have ever operated strongly in healing uh, had an easy life or did not have someone, either themselves or someone in their family, that was a life or death situation that they had to pursue healing and because of that they ended up blessing a lot of other humans uh, other than just their own family. So I want you to rest assured what I'm teaching you this week is not based upon a gift even though gifts operate. Uh, it's not based upon anointings. Uh, we'll teach you more about that a little bit later on. But it is based upon Mark 16 that says that believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So if we talk based on gifts, maybe you have it, maybe you don't. If you don't, I really can't help you if I was teaching on gifts. If I was teaching on an anointing, then if you had that anointing, great. But if you didn't, then it really doesn't do you any good to be here. But since we're teaching you based on Mark 16, which is for every believer, then what I will be teaching you will work for every one of you in this room if you're a believer. Amen? Matter of fact, I'll even go further than that. Even if you're not a Christian, healing will still work for you and God will work through you to heal others, right? But you don't want to be in that class because Jesus mentioned people that said, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and didn't we do that in your name? And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, meaning they were still in sin. And he said, because I never knew you. It means that they were not born again. And so God will work through people to help other people, even unborn again people. Uh, but as I said, you don't want to be in that group, all right? 
So, now if you're in that group now, then just repent, get saved, and jump right in, and you know, then, then you're on the other side, okay? Um, <clears throat> but we'll be going through this, and we will share with you uh, personal testimonies. I, I, many years ago, when I first started studying, um, I told God at that point, I will never teach theory. Um, this kind of goes back to my martial arts training. When I got into martial arts, I was interested in one thing. I wasn't interested in the uniforms. I wasn't interested in the beauty of the katas or the, the forms that we practice. I was interested in winning street fights. That was the only purpose. Um, in that, I found out that <clears throat> in studying fighting for many years, the greatest fighters weren't the ones that knew the most. The best fighters usually only knew about three or four things and their, their skill came in being able to maneuver their opponent into a position where they could do those three or four things that they did best. Uh, obviously, men like Muhammad Ali come to mind. He uh, was a master at the rope-a-dope and at lulling his opponent into a false sense of security before he unleashed a barrage that usually knocked him out. And so there's a lot of aspects to this. And you say, well, I, I don't like all these, you know, these, these secular um, illustrations. Then you wouldn't have liked Jesus. Because he used a lot of secular illustrations uh, to illustrate the kingdom. So uh, we'll be talking about those. And, and you'll see as we go along that essentially what we're going to try to do during these three days is whittle you down until you realize that the only thing you bring to the table is your willingness to be obedient to God. Essentially, that's it. Everything else, God prepares. It's just, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just like being in the military. Uh, basically, all they want from you is sign on the dotted line, raise your right hand, say the oath, and then get in line, get on the bus, and they'll deal with you from there on. All right? And they're going to take you down, shave your hair. Uh, mainly, they don't need to, but they just do that to show you that you're theirs. <clears throat> and that they can do whatever they want to with you. <clears throat> then they're going to put you in a uniform, and the first thing they're going to do is not make you the Rambo type of person where you stand out. They don't want individuality. They want conformity, right? Which is funny because, you know, it's the individual that we celebrate. Uh, we don't generally make movies about armies. We make them about Rambos, right? But the military wants conformity. And so, as we, um, as we see, what they want you to do is show up and then they're going to break you down and rebuild you into the person they want you to be. They really don't care what you come in with, right? You're all kind of go, you're going to go through the same process pretty much across the line. But, and one of the things that I really admire about the, especially the U.S. military, is their ability to take any person from any walk of life. And within a matter of months, they're a soldier just like anybody else, which proves not so much the individual ability, but the expertise of the military in doing their training. And so, if the church is supposed to be the army of God, so to speak, we have the best trainer, called the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> we have the best weapons, our weapons are spiritual, not carnal. Therefore, they can defeat anything carnal. And we have the name. We have his spirit. We have his power. We have his word. We have the operations manual. We got everything we need. Now, the question that we should ask would be, if what we've been doing is right, how come we have not produced any, anybody that resembles Jesus? Which means... What we've been doing has not been right. So, Jesus said that the church would get stronger as time went on, not weaker. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter, not dimmer and dimmer. And so the church today, and that, that's one of the problems in the church, if you don't believe that you can surpass the generals and the giants of the past, then you won't. And we have to realize that John Lake was a man, made mistakes, but he wasn't meant to be the epitome. He was meant to be a stepping stone for us to learn from and to achieve greater than he did. Now, in his 10 years 
well, actually, he was in Pentecostal ministry for about 25 years total. Uh, during that time, there was a five-year period in Spokane, Washington, where he had 100,000 healings in five years. So that's about 20,000 per year. Uh, then he moved to Portland, Oregon, did the exact same thing, another 100,000 healings in five years, right? Which, the reason he moved to Portland and did it was because people said, oh, you can only do that here in Spokane because this, uh, this area has a spiritual anointing on it. Kind of the same kind of nonsense that people say today about different things. Well, he said, I'll prove to you that what I do, I do by the word of God and not because of a place. And so he moved to Portland, did the exact same thing using the word of God. Um, now, as I said, they saw 20,000 healings per month. We have, he trained 16 men and women to be divine healing technicians, which is what I'll be teaching you these next three days. It was those 16 people that saw most of those 20,000 healings per month or per year. Now we have trained uh, since 19, what? No, since 2001, we began teaching the DHT openly and in public. And we have trained right, approximately 50,000 people now. We still get, uh, we try to stay in contact with them. We get emails from them, phone calls, different things. We have a report form that many of them send in. We hear from about 10%, which is about average. Um, out of that 10%, which would be about 5,000 people, we are generally seeing about 30,000 healings per month. Right? So, right now, John J. Lake Ministries is seeing more in a month than John Lake saw during, in his life in a year. Right? And part of that is because of the number of people that have been taught in the practice, but it is also because <clears throat> what we're doing is that we are surpassing what he did because we were meant to. Right? The church has to move forward. If you don't believe we can surpass them, then you will, you'll get, for many years, no one beat the four-minute mile. But once one person did, within a matter of months, everybody was doing it. And so our problem is we look back at the greats of the old days and think that they did things that we can never do. Rather than realizing that all they did was they, they broke the four-minute mile first, and now that should be a common thing with all of us, that we ought to all be able to do what any of them have done. And so the main thing is our problem is we focus on a person rather than the person of Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus that worked through John Lake. It was Jesus that worked through Smith Wigglesworth. And if that same spirit dwells in you, then you should be able to do what they did. Amen? So, take a break. About 15 minutes, actually about 14 minutes. And be seated by 15 after and we'll get started. Amen? <laughs> 